Hi everyone, Colby Wright here. Wanted to record a supplemental lecture. I know that we've been doing a lot of freestyling in class, which I hope has been productive for you. I hope that you've enjoyed it and found it informative. But I also do have some very specific material that I need to deliver. Hence, I'm going to do this uh, video lecture for us for parts of Chapter 3. So today we're going to focus on financial markets and financial institutions. Uh, as a reminder, as a reminder, there are six components of our financial system. You read this in Chapter 1, money, financial markets, financial instruments, financial institutions, government regulatory agencies, and central banks. Uh, our objective this semester is to work through all six of those things. Now, keep in mind on the subject of money, that was the focus of Chapter 2. I didn't spend much time in class lecturing on it. I kind of allowed the book to do all the talking on the subject of money. But I do want to talk about financial markets, financial instruments, institutions, and government regulatory agencies and central banks. And we're be beginning those discussions both in class and through this video. If you remember, what we talked about in the most recent class is we talked about financial instruments. And at the very end of class, we were talking about something called credit default swaps. I want to just refresh your memory on what a credit default swap is. But before we talk about credit default swaps, I just want to remind you that financial instruments are very, very important in our financial system because financial instruments Although they do a lot of the same things that money does, they can be a store of wealth, they can be a means of payment, financial instruments do something that money really doesn't. Financial instruments allow people to transfer risk, and that's really important because the ability to transfer risk changes human behavior. And this goes all the way back to the first lecture that we had where we thought about the importance of specialization and exchange. We thought about how hard it would be to specialize and exchange if you didn't have the six components of our financial system. And you might remember we did a thought experiment. What if you lived on a farm in the early 1800s? There wasn't much specialization in exchange. Uh, you had to do a lot of the labor, provide for a lot of your own necessities. What if you wanted to actually take that leap and try to specialize in exchange. So what if you were just going to grow corn? And you remember we had a really long conversation about all of the risks you would face and how financial instruments, financial markets, money, all of these elements of the financial system would make it possible for you to mitigate the risks that would otherwise prevent you from specializing and exchanging. Just as one example, one of the risks you would face is the perishable nature of your assets because most of your wealth would be in the form of corn. And that's problematic. However, if you introduce money, now you can transform your perishable assets into more durable assets in the form of money. And so all of those elements of the financial system really are necessary. But financial instruments in particular are the primary way that we transfer risk from ourselves to other people. And again, being able to transfer risks being able to transfer risks allows us to change human behavior. So I wanted to remind you about credit default swaps. So here's the idea of a credit default swap, just the very basics. Imagine that you have an investor who buys a million dollars worth of Ford bonds, and those bonds are yielding 3.79%. But imagine that that investor wants some protection against default. For whatever reason, the investor is worried that there might be default on these bonds. So he goes out and buys a CDS contract from Deutsche Bank. So that means the investor is now the buyer of the credit default swap and Deutsche Bank is the seller of the credit default swap. Well, one of the problems with credit default swaps is they are very, very, very non-standard. So they're, they're mostly customized for the specific transaction. So, and th this is all hypothetical. Everything I'm showing you right now is hypothetical. But imagine that the terms on this CD contract are five years. The notional amount is $1 million. It requires quarterly premium payments from the buyer to the seller. The annual premium is 100 basis points. The default event in the contract is a missed interest payment and settlement is going to be cash as opposed to physical settlement. So imagine that these are the basics of your credit default swap. So what does that mean? That means every quarter, this investor is going to have to pay $2,500 to Deutsche Bank because the price on the contract is 1% or 100 basis points. The notional amount is a million dollars. 1% of a million dollars is $10,000.
So every quarter, we're going to have to pay $2,500 to the seller of the credit default swap. But what if there is a default? What if Ford misses an interest payment? Well, this is cash settlement. So what's going to happen is Deutsche Bank is going to have to make the investor whole by calculating the difference between the notional amount, which is a million dollars, and the market value of the bonds after the default. So if the bonds drop to $750,000 in market value, then Deutsche Bank is going to have to send $250,000 over to the investor. So this is the basic, uh, the basic idea of credit default swaps. But remember, we talked about the fact in class that there were some unique features around credit default swaps. First off, you don't have to have any affiliation with Ford in order to get in the game. So you don't have to own a Ford bond to go and buy or sell a credit default swap. Also, anybody who buys or sells credit default swaps can turn around and take the opposite side. So for instance, in our hypothetical example, if Deutsche Bank sold a credit default swap at 100 basis points, what if the price drops after that? Deutsche Bank could turn around and buy a credit default swap on Ford Motor Company bonds and maybe now the price is only 90 basis points. And then this person who sold the credit default swap to Deutsche Bank at 90 basis points could turn around and they could also buy a credit default swap. And, and this is sort of what happened during the crisis. Imagine that Ford Motor Company starts to experience distress. Now default looks more probable. So now let's say that the uh, price to insure, which is what a credit default swap is, it's an insurance contract. Well, if the likelihood of default for Ford Motor Company increases, then you're going to see the price on the insurance product skyrocket. So maybe this entity now goes and buys from somebody else at 200 basis points. Now, you might be asking yourselves, why would you do that? Because here's how that plays out. We already know that in the original contract, that means there's a $10,000 annual premium. But if this contract also gets signed, that means Deutsche Bank is sending $9,000 to this seller. And over here, now this person is sending $20,000 over to this seller. But why would this entity do that? You can see why Deutsche Bank would do that. Deutsche Bank is getting a spread now. Deutsche Bank's earning $10,000 and only having to pay $9,000. But what in the world is this entity doing? Receiving $9,000 and only paying $20,000. Or sorry, receiving $9,000 and having to pay $20,000. Well, if you truly believe that default is eminent, you might want to do that because you're hedging your loss given default. Because now if the Ford Motor Company bond defaults, it's going to be this person who has to make this ultimate buyer of the credit default swap whole. So this person is willing to accept some losses in the annual premium payments to avoid having to make the big payment. And, and this is what happened. We created a massive web in the credit default swap market. And one of the problems was there was a lot of uh, opaqueness in the market. We didn't know who these entities were. And then when the dust settled, we found out that it was companies like AIG who were actually on the hook. Created big problems because this investor thought they had entered into a contract with Deutsche Bank, but in reality, because of the cascading of these contracts, it was actually AIG on the other side of the contract. And of course, AIG buckled under the pressure. We talked about this in class on the hook for billions of dollars of notional value CDS contracts, sustained billions of dollars worth of losses because of it. And the US government had to step in. Otherwise, they weren't going to be able to make these payments to investors who thought they were protected. How bad did it get? Well, in notional terms, so notional just means what was the total value of all bonds that were protected by CDS contracts. And we should recognize not all of those CDS contracts were going to experience a default event. So this is kind of overstating the problem, but at least it gives you a visual on the magnitude. So at its height in late 2007, the notional amount of the CDS market was over $60 trillion dollars over 60 trillion dollars in notional amount keep in mind us gdp is only 19 trillion dollars the notional amount of the cds market was over three times the size of us gdp in fact it was twice the size over twice the size of the total bond market so think about that there were more insurance contracts in terms of dollar value on bonds than there were actually bonds being insured Astounding.
well, what caused this? What caused this? And we know, by the way, that the collapse of the CDS market as bonds started to default, as real estate prices contracted and uh, defaults in the loan market started to increase. And, and we'll walk through all of those dominoes later in the semester. But we know that the CDS market was a big big problem during the financial crisis and one of the main reasons that the US government had to step in and bail out a lot of companies. So what caused it? Well, there were at least three problems in the CDS market. One was a complete lack of liquidity because there was no standardization because all of these contracts were customized. There were no centralized exchanges, tremendous illiquidity. There was also a massive lack of transparency because there were no centralized exchanges and markets and there was no standardization. Nobody knew who was on the other side of the contract, which led to massive counterparty risk. So these three problems all combine to create big, big issues for us during that crisis. Well, it turns out that the solution to these three problems is to have financial markets and financial institutions. And so I want to spend a few minutes just trying to convince you that financial markets and financial institutions can help to minimize these problems that we saw pop up during the financial crisis in the CDS market. And I want to try to demonstrate this to you by introducing you to something called the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange is a great case study for today's topics of financial markets and financial institutions because the Chicago Mercantile Exchange actually serves the function of both. It is both a market and a financial institution. And I'm going to try to demonstrate to you how it serves both of those functions. So let's roll forward. And I want to talk for a second about something called price risk. And in order to understand price risk, I want you to think about an airline, whether it's Delta, United, American, whatever the airline is, I want you to just imagine an airline, okay? Airlines face a really significant problem in the form of price risk. And the price risk arises from the asynchronous timing, timing of the revenues and expenses. So think about revenues and expenses for an airline. Uh, we know that revenues come primarily from selling seats on a flight and also from in-flight sales of drinks and snacks and whatnot. The expenses come primarily in the form of the airplane, which are almost all leased, uh, the pilots and the ground crew and the flight attendants, so labor. But one of the biggest expense items for an airline is fuel. And it turns out that fuel prices, jet fuel prices, fluctuate over time. But think about the issue that an airline faces. It has to sell those seats anywhere from what, a week? to six months in advance of the flight, but it doesn't consume the jet fuel until it actually takes off. And it's not paying for that jet fuel much in advance of that flight, quite honestly. So the revenues are being locked in weeks or months in advance of the expenses being incurred. In between the time that the airline locks in the revenue and actually incurs the expense, jet fuel prices can change. And specifically, if jet fuel prices rise sharply after the revenues are locked in, then your margin for each flight is going to get squeezed and you could actually incur losses. This is price risk. Almost every company experiences one form of price risk or another. Consider Kellogg's. This is some of the cereal products that Kellogg's puts out there, Corn Flakes, Rice Krispies, Frosted Flakes, Raisin Bran. So think for a second about some of the key raw materials. Think about some of the key expenses, the big expense items that Kellogg's faces. And you'll think grain prices. It's grain prices. And specifically, Kellogg's is going to be in a world of hurt if grain prices rise precipitously. Now, why is Kellogg's going to be in a world of hurt if grain prices rise precipitously? So we can think specifically about, for instance, wheat. Wheat is one of the key ingredients for a lot of their products. What if wheat prices rise dramatically? Well, the question becomes this. Can Kellogg's 
pass on those increases in wheat, in wheat prices to its customers? And the answer is, well, it depends. It depends on, in economic terms, what we call the price elasticity of demand, the price elasticity of demand. All that means is, if prices rise, what happens to demand? And for some products, if prices rise, demand doesn't really change. Uh, the poster child for this would be cigarettes. People are addicted to cigarettes. They got to have their cigarettes. Even if prices rise, demand's not going to change. But other products, however, have a very high price elasticity of demand, meaning demand changes a lot when price rises. And it all has to do with the economic principle of substitutes. What you're going to find is if a product has a lot of substitutes, then you're going to see, going to see demand shift measurably when prices rise. Well, think about Kellogg's products. They sell cereal, granola bars. Do you think there are a lot of substitutes out there for cereal? And the answer is yes. People eat a lot of different things for breakfast. People eat yogurt. People eat oatmeal. People eat fruit. So it doesn't have to be products that contain wheat. There's a lot of substitutes. And if there's a lot of substitutes, you're going to see a high price elasticity of demand. If you see a high price elasticity of demand, you can't pass the shocks in the price of your raw materials onto your customers. So the question becomes, how do you mitigate this risk, this price risk that Kellogg's faces? Well, generally speaking, there are two ways to mitigate risk. The first way is to pay somebody to take it from you. For instance, we talked last class about me facing the risk of uh, dying early and my family would face financial ruin. That's a risk we don't want to take. So we pay somebody else to bear that risk in the form of life insurance. Turns out, however, it's very hard to convince people to assume your price risk by paying them because it's almost impossible to predict. See, insurance companies are happy to sell you life insurance because there's mountains of statistics and data that allow them to sort of forecast at what age, on average, a person like me would die. Therefore, they can calculate out what the right price is for the premiums. But when it comes to price risk, there are no good models. There are no good statistics. There are no good data sets that are going to help a company predict when grain prices are going to go up or go down. So there's almost no entities out there that are willing to, to, uh, to take your risk in the form of payment. So if you can't do that, the other way to mitigate risk is by swapping it with somebody for a different risk. Let me try to demonstrate what I mean. Think of it this way. Kellogg's faces two, two possibilities with prices. Wheat prices might rise, and if wheat prices rise, Kellogg's is not going to be very happy about that. However, if wheat prices fall, Kellogg's will think that's fantastic because their margins are going to get bigger. They'll just keep their cereal prices constant, but their raw material prices will go down. Well, the question becomes, is there any entity out there that views wheat prices differently? Is there any entity out there that would be happy if wheat prices rise and disappointed if wheat prices fall? And if so, maybe there is the potential for Kellogg's to enter into a partnership. And hopefully you can see that if Kellogg's can find that entity and enter into a partnership, then collectively the partnership would have neutralized the price risk of wheat. Well, I think you've probably already realized it's obvious who would feel good if wheat prices rose and who would be upset if wheat prices fall. And the answer is the wheat farmer. The wheat farmer would love it if wheat prices would rise because wheat farmers, just like airlines, face an asynchronous timing problem. They incur most of their expenses in the spring and the summer, buying the seed, the fertilizer, the fuel for the trucks, but they don't get their revenues until the fall. Same problem. You might incur all these expenses, lock in the expenses, and then the revenues actually fluctuate and you can have losses just because of fluctuations in the market prices of your product. So Kellogg's and the wheat farmer, farmer have the potential to enter into a partnership and that partnership jointly can neutralize price risk. But, so there's the partnership, the potential partnership between the farmer and Kellogg's. You can decide which one is the farmer and which one is Kellogg's. But the question becomes, how do they find each other? Should Kellogg's go knocking on doors in Nebraska? Should they look online and see if they can locate farmers in Iowa and start cold calling them?
it turns out this question right here is exactly why you need a market. So behold the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange is both a market and a financial institution. This is a place that brings together buyers and sellers. Now I want to introduce you to a specific product that is traded on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. It's called Wheat Futures Contracts. Here's how a Wheat Futures contract works. Somebody enters on the buy side, somebody enters on the sell side. It is an agreement, it is an agreement to be executed in the future at a price agreed upon today. Let me say that again. A futures contract is an agreement to execute a transaction in the future at a price agreed upon today. Turns out that with the futures contract at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, one contract represents 5,000 bushels. It's quoted in cents per bushel, and the tick is a quarter of a cent. Uh, so then let me show you what else. So there's all these contracts. So you can see, for instance, there is a December 2018 wheat futures contract at 5.30 and 2 and uh, 2 quarters, right? Yep. At 5.30 and 2 quarters. So what does that mean? One contract represents 5,000 bushels. That means somebody's going to buy 5,000 bushels of wheat and somebody's going to sell 5,000 bushels of wheat. The agreed upon price is $5.30 and two fourths of a cent, so one half. So $5.30 and one half cent per bushel, but again, 5,000 bushels. So what does that mean? Whoever's the buyer is going to buy 5,000 bushels at approximately $5.30 a bushel. Whoever is selling is going to sell 5,000 bushels at approximately $5.30 per bushel. And this is going to take place in December of 2018. So do you see the beauty of this? Kellogg's and the farmer can link arms by entering into a futures contract to agree to buy and sell a certain amount of wheat a full year out from where we are right now. That's what we're talking about in terms of a wheat futures contract. And the Chicago Mercantile Exchange is the house where all of the trading takes place for wheat futures contracts. So if you're Kellogg's and you want to find a farmer, you go to the Merck. If you're a farmer and you want to find somebody like Kellogg's, you go to the Merck. Saves a ton of time for us. But there's another problem that pops up. What about counterparty risk? There is the possibility that if there wasn't something like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, a farmer might enter into a futures contract with somebody and the farmer's excited, the farmer's locked in the price, $5.30 a bushel, and I'm going to sell this wheat six months or a year out, but at least I know what the price is going to be so I can manage my budget, I can incur my expenses, I can preserve my margins. But then what if, what if a farmer enters into a futures contract in April to sell wheat in September at $5.30 a bushel, and then September rolls around and wheat prices have dropped precipitously. What if the spot price, meaning the prevailing market price in September is now $4 a bushel? Well, the farmer is thinking, oh man, I'm so glad I entered into that futures contract because I get to sell it at $5.30. But what if the farmer goes to the counterparty and says, hey, I've got your wheat. We agreed on $5.30. And what if the counterparty says, I never agreed to that. I'm not going to buy your wheat at $5.30. I'll buy it at $4 a bushel because that's the prevailing market price. Well, you can imagine how upset the farmer would be and that used to happen, but it doesn't happen when you're trading on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and here is why. Let's read. This is directly from the Merck website. CME Clearing serves as the counterparty to every cleared transaction, becoming the buyer to each seller and the seller to each buyer, limiting credit risk by guaranteeing financial performance of both parties. What is the Chicago Mercantile Exchange saying? Even though you enter a futures contract with a counterparty, we're actually the ones that are going to settle it. It's the cash is coming from us. So you're never actually having to worry about whether or not your counterparty is going to try to get out of the contract or abuse you because you know that the Chicago Mercantile Exchange is actually the entity that's going to be giving you the cash. Now, 
How does the Chicago Mercantile Exchange do this? Well, they have initial capital requirements. You cannot be a buyer or seller of futures on the Merck unless you put up a significant amount of initial capital with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. They also have what are called maintenance margin requirements. You have to keep a cash balance there that's adequate in their eyes in order for you to actually meet your obligations. They also have collateral requirements. Now look, I don't want to get into the weeds on that. Here's the layman's terms. The Chicago Mercantile is actually your trading partner in all transactions. It strictly monitors all parties trading on the CME and requires them to have adequate cash and assets at all time so that if, you enter, if you're the farmer and you enter into a futures contract with Kellogg's, the CME is going to make sure that you get made whole in that transaction. So what are the benefits of this? Well, think about that. You don't have to worry about counterparty risk. If you trade on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, you do not have to worry about counterparty risk. So this encourages trading, facilitates liquidity, saves an enormous amount of time because you don't have to go and do any research on the counterparty to make sure that they're good for it. You know that the counterparties are good for it. It also improves price efficiency because now you don't have to impound counterparty risk into your prices. So there's no discounts for counterparty risk. So we celebrate and we party this thing called the Chicago Mercantile Exchange serves as both the market bringing buyers and sellers of wheat futures contracts together, allowing them to jointly mitigate price risk, preserving margins for both Kellogg's and the farmer. And it serves as a financial institution, ensuring that there is no counterparty risk by requiring adequate capital, collateral, and maintenance margins. But, and, and I should add, we do need financial institutions and we do need financial markets, but sometimes, just like financial instruments can occasionally turn destructive like credit default swaps did, sometimes financial inst institutions can also be problematic as well because they can get too big. What we mean is they can get too big to fail. Don't misinterpret. When we say too big to fail, we don't mean that they're so big that they can't fail. What we mean is they are so big and so important to our economy that if they do fail, it's going to blow up our whole system. So as a country, sometimes companies get so big that we can't let them fail. And then we end up having to bail them out just like we did with AIG. And this is very costly. This is very costly, but why? Why is it that companies get too big to fail? Well, it turns out that in capitalism, there is always an incentive to get big. So I've entitled this slide, go big or go home. And why is that? There is so much competition in capitalism that typically the bigger companies win. And why is it? It's because they can capture the economies of scale. They can get the cost savings from producing more and more of the good or the service. They can capture economies of scope, sharing technologies and synergies across products and divisions. Also, if they get big enough, they can decrease competition. Most people would say Walmart's been doing this for years. They've gotten so big that they're kind of snuffing out all of the competition, which gives you more market and more pricing power. So the bottom line is capitalism is always going to incentivize companies to get as big as they can to capture and reap all of these benefits. Let me just give you some data to try to corroborate this. I want you to look in 1995. This was the allocation of all deposits across banks in the U.S. And you can see that about 32% of deposits were in large banks, 1% in large credit unions, 26% in medium banks, 1% in medium credit unions, 28% in small banks, 7% in giant banks, 6% in small credit unions. Pretty evenly distributed across large banks, medium banks, and small banks. Here's what it looks like in 2014. 58% of all deposits in 2014 were in just the giant banks. In fact, if I remember right, 40% of all deposits were in just these four banks, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, and Citigroup. So think, look at that. In 1995, only 7% of deposits were in giant banks. 
Now 58% of all deposits are in giant banks. Look, this just corroborates the statement that in capitalism, companies have incentives to get big. But if we're not careful, they're going to get so big that if they fail, it will blow up our whole system. And then we got to bail them out. Well, what do you do? I see only three options. You can do nothing. You can let companies get monstrous, monolithic, let them turn into behemoths, and then let them die. And whatever the consequences are, we just deal with it. Most people say that's not possible. There's a reason why they're called too big to fail. You can't just let them fail. So the next option is, well, okay, do nothing, but then bail them out when they do fail. Uh, the third option is no, 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 like we're not going to let these companies get huge and then when the dumpster fire ignites, we're going to freak out and bail them out. We're not going to do that. We're going to prevent the cluster bomb from even going off. We're going to monitor companies. We're going to regulate them. And if they get too big and we're worried that they might actually pose systemic risk to our economy, that's what it's called, systemic risk. If we're worried that they're going to pose systemic risk, monitor, regulate, and fracture the things. And we've seen this. If you want a case study on it, go look at the baby bells back in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, landline telephone companies had natural monopolies. I'll let you think about that. You should have learned about that in Econ 110. Landline telephone companies had natural monopolies. They were asserting way too much price power and control. So our government actually went in and fractured them and turned them into the baby bells. So we've seen this before. Well, you might be sitting there saying, yeah, okay, great. Monitor, regulate, and fracture. That's the right thing to do, right? Isn't that what we should do? Well, it's not so clear. Because it turns out that monitoring, regulating, and fracturing actually costs a lot of money. It takes taxpayer dollars to hire the people, have the agencies, have oversight, and, it's, and it takes money to fight the lawsuits when companies try to take you to court over it. And then here's the really sad part you may not even successfully prevent the companies from becoming too big to fail. In fact, Stephen Colbert has a very funny video out there if you can find it. I have not been able to find it lately. But Stephen Colbert has a very funny video where he walks you through the history of AT&T and he shows how in the late 70s and early 80s, it got fractured. We monitored, we regulated, we fractured, we broke it up into the baby bells. And then over time, it reconstituted. And literally, it came all the way back together by 2007. So if you can find that video, go check it out. But think about that. If that's what happens, if we're going to monitor, regulate, fracture, we're going to incur all of those costs, hiring all of those regulators and monitors and overseers. We're going to spend all that money and then in the end, we're still going to have companies that are too big to fail. This poses a big problem for us. And I can tell you, one of the issues we have wrestled with a lot coming out of the crisis is how do we deal with the issue of too big to fail? We'll have a little bit more to say about it later in the semester. But just as a teaser, Dodd-Frank, the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010, which was our reaction to the financial crisis of 2008, the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010 is primarily concerned with this issue of preventing companies from becoming too big to fail and then trying to allow for a soft landing if one of those companies does fail. Well, that's it for now. I will see you in class.